go ahead and start things off. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Army Navy Club virtual forum. My name is Don Hooper. I'm a member of the Special Events Committee and I'm gonna be your host for this evening. Uh, tonight's webinar is Eliminating Serious Chemical Weapons with Al Maroney. Um, before I get into uh, or allow Al to get into his presentation and do the introduction of him, I just want to uh, drink, draw your attention to a couple upcoming virtual events that are gonna be occurring later this week and next week. So on January 21st, we've got Night of the Assassins, the untold story of Hitler's plot to kill FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. Uh, that's going to be at 6.30, same format uh, as, as before and same uh, ways to register. Uh, next, uh, on Friday, we actually have a webinar that was supposed to be in person, but is has gone virtual with the, um, with the status of, our, uh, uh, of the club this week, but it is gonna be Military Drink Traditions, The Origins of and How To with Philip Green. Uh, that's gonna be Friday at 6 p.m. And again, same thing, log in uh, to your app and sign up uh, for that if you're uh, interested. And then next, uh, the following week on January 26th, we have The Ghost Ships of Archangel. Again, that was supposed to be a in-person uh, book forum that had to switch to the virtual format. Uh, but that's January 26th at 6.30. So if you're interested, by all means, please go ahead and sign up. Um, before doing the, the uh, introduction to our speaker, just a little, uh, some ground rules um, for the Q&A portion. If this is your first time being uh, on one of these, um, you'll need to know that we have a chat function and a question and answer function. So if you've got a question that you would like me to ask the panelists later on, um, go ahead and type it in that question and answer format. If there's something you just want to chat with the, the group about, that's what the, the chat function uh, is for. Um, and just so everybody knows that this is being recorded and will be available uh, after Elizabeth does the editing on the Army-Navy uh, Club website. And uh, you'll be able to, to either review it or if somebody you know missed it, you can pull it up for them and watch it. So now without further de uh, delay, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker, um, Al Maroney. Uh, he is the director of the U.S. Air Force's Center for Strategic Deterrence Studies at the Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. He's got more than 35 years experience in the Department of Defense counter weapons of mass destruction policy and program development. In his current position, he oversees the development and execution of Air Force education, education research, outreach initiatives, relating to counter WMD and nuclear deterrence operations. He also teaches at the Air University. Um, he served in the United States Army as a chemical officer for seven years before leaving active duty. Um, from there, he went on and supported the Army Soldiers and Biological Chemical Command in the J-5 and J directorates of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, He's worked at DITRA. Um, he's worked at Headquarters Air Force and Strategic Plans and Policies as a defense contractor and a government civilian. Uh, he holds a master's degree in administration from Central Michigan University and bachelor's degree in chemistry from Carnegie Mellon, Mellon excuse me, uh, University. He's the author of seven books and numerous journals and uh, journal articles to include articles in War on the Rocks, Modern War Institute, Texas Security Review, and Joint Forces quarterly. His latest book is Countering WMD, Assessing the U.S. Government's Policy. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Maroney, please go ahead and, uh, and take over and, and then uh, 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 present your, uh, your presentation to us. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Don. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank Tom Wallison for inviting me to talk about this subject. And I do need to state that this presentation represents my own views and does not necessarily represent a position of the US government. About 10 years ago, Syria descended into a civil war that escalated beyond the regime's ability to control its people through conventional security measures. As a result, President Bashir al-Assad authorized the small scale use of chemical weapons to push back and quell the civilian uprising. After a few years of escalating violence, Syrian military forces used chemical weapons on a region outside of Damascus called Gouda, causing an estimated 1,400 deaths and 3,600 injuries. This crossed a declared red line of President Barack Obama, who stated his intent to compel Assad to stop using chemical weapons through U.S. cruise missile attacks 
against Syrian military targets. Due in no small part to Russian interventions, the Syrian government said that it would abandon its chemical weapons program in exchange for not being attacked by the United States. Because Syria was not in a good condition to destroy its chemical weapons on its own, it fell to the United States and a coalition of nations to support the removal of Syria's declared chemical weapons. This was not an easy effort to organize and execute, requiring interagency and international coordination, as well as conducting operations across combatant commands. The US Army had a significant role in the development of a prototype chemical disposal process that successfully neutralized about 600 tons of chemicals. My talk will cover how this response was developed and executed and provide some observations on what we could have done better. The conflict in Syria has been mostly a controversial topic in part due to people questioning whether the United States has any significant national security interests in that regime's struggle for survival. Since the end of the Cold War, the US policy addressing adversarial nations with the WMD program has been to support international arms control efforts and to develop means to protect against the use of WMD against US forces. This mission has dropped in visibility over the past three decades as more and more nations have gotten out of the business of developing chemical and biological weapons. Syria is one of the last holdouts in this sense, but has a complicated relationship with the West that has prevented much scrutiny about its WMD program. In particular, we didn't really care about countries that had chem bio programs in the Middle East because they were seen as largely moderate US partners that could be counted on to counter Iranian regional objectives. That was until Assad started using chemical weapons in 2012 and notably sarin nerve agent against his civilian population that was harboring insurgents. Syria is not, was not a signatory to the Chemical Weapons Convention Treaty, so it was not violating any laws by using chemical weapons within its borders as an internal security measure. And certainly there were more conventional casualties by at least a few orders of magnitude. So what was the US government getting all excited about? While the Syrian government had agreed to the US-Russian conditions, it required assistance to meet the US demand of immediate removal of these chemical weapons. So this job fell to the US Army to execute. How the military supported this event should identify challenges of dealing with North Korea's larger chemical arsenal in the future. Syria is one of the na number of nations in the Middle East that has sought to develop chemical and biological weapons for the purpose of a strategic deterrent against attacks by its neighbors. Our own chemical weapons policy in the 1970s and 1980s was much the same. The Soviet Union, however, was a source of technology, materials, and munitions for both conventional and unconventional weapons in the 1970s and 1980s. It should not be a surprise that the main delivery systems of the, these chemical munitions include Soviet-era rocket launchers, Scud missiles, and aerial bombs on Soviet-era aircraft. Syria and other Middle East nations have all sought to develop an indig indigenous source for the chemical precursors required to develop chemical weapons, in part to demonstrate their independence and in part to develop their own industrial infrastructure. Syria remained reliant on external sources for its chemical precursors for most of this time. In particular, after the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, Western nations and their partners began controlling the exports of bulk chemicals uh, precursors to those nations seeking to develop chemical weapons. So eventually Syria did develop its own production capabilities, but its chemical weapons capability has never really been robust. U.S. intelligence assessments identified Assad's interests in maintaining a strategic deterrent against Israeli ground forces attacking into Syria for the purposes of overthrowing the regime and to deter Iraq from uh, uh, any attacks against the regime. Egypt and Iraq also had chemical weapon programs for the same reasons, and Libya and Iran also had interest in this area. The U.S. assessment did not believe that Syria would use the chemical weapons in a surprise attack or early in a war 
because of the threat of massive Israeli retaliation. The Iran-Iraq war that included the use of chemical weapons appeared to have lowered the threshold for use in the region. But at the time, the US government was not protesting against Iraq's use of chemical weapons against Iranian military forces, nor was the US government particularly concerned about Syria's chemical weapons capability. And in fact, Syrian military forces participated in the US coalition attack against Iraq in 1991. By this time, Syria did have a mature chemical weapons program that in the CIA's assessment would not be stopped by Israeli air attacks. The Syrian chemical weapons program did not have V-series nerve agents, but was working on it. The US intel okay. assessment I found this on the web, the chemical weapons. did not believe that Assad would uh, give any chemical weapons to Lebanese militia or Palestinian organizations because of limited control over such groups. The Syrian civil war started in March 2011 when Syrian security forces killed dozens of people in Dara. <coughs> Excuse me. This caused a wave of continuing mass protests across the nation and within a year, the internal conflict had caused up to 10,000 dead. In an effort to crack the dissent, Assad allowed security forces to use chemical weapons in small amounts, perhaps to test Western resolve and forestall any attempts to interfere with Syria's internal conflict. But this did cause the US government to start talking about military options to stop Assad's use of chemical weapons. In July 2012, the Syrian foreign ministry spokesman stated that Syria had an unconventional weapons capability but that these weapons would only be used in the event of external aggression against Syria. So this was kind of remarkable as the first time a Syrian government official had publicly acknowledged that Syria had a chemical weapons program. So this chart reflects a number of the alleged chemical weapons attacks as reported by various government agencies. Not all of these attacks have been verified as to their source, number of casualties or type of agent in part due to the inability to obtain clinical or environmental samples directly from the victims or sites of the attacks. On August 20th, 2013, President Obama made his famous red line statement that the use of chemical weapons is and would be totally unacceptable. And if you make the tragic mistake of using these weapons, there will be consequences and you will be held accountable. To be clear, the threat of retaliation was for the Syrian use of chemical weapons and not the widespread use of its conventional weapons. Just to give you a, a point of scale, between 2011 and 2013, more than 50,000 civilians and around 30,000 insurgents had died overwhelmingly due to Syrian military forces using conventional weapons. But the international community was only worried about the precedent of chemical weapons being used in a conflict. So on August 21st, 2013, Syrian forces conducted several artillery strikes in the Damascus suburbs known as Ghouta between 2 and 5 a.m. This was not the result of one attack, but rather several surface-to-surface -surface rockets. This was the largest attack to date. Syrian forces may not have meant to cause such high casualty rates as uh, 5,000 dead and injured but these were used in, during optimal times for a large scale attack early in the morning with, and with low winds. And this might've aided in the spread of the agent. In Western Ghouta, there were maybe four or five artillery rockets that may have had sarin nerve agent fills based on clinical samples obtained from the casualties from this BM-14 rocket launcher. The Syrian military is believed to have procured about 200 of these launchers from the Soviet Union during the late 1960s. Each of these rockets can hold about 2.2 kilograms of sarin. There were no rocket heads, warheads recovered, but there were remnants of the rockets that suggested this weapon system was used. Uh, but this was decidedly the smaller of the two major attacks on Ghouta. <clears throat> 
The Eastern attack was significantly more lethal with evidence that at least eight large artillery rockets were used to deliver sarin agent against the population center. These rockets appeared to be of a Syrian design known as the family of volcano rockets, which can have either a chemical or a high yield explosive warhead. These rockets were based on the 122 millimeter artillery rocket made popular by the Soviet BM-21 Grad, sporting 330 millimeter stabilizing fins. So you may see press reports or investigative reports talking to a 330 millimeter rocket, but we go more by the 122 millimeter uh, guidance. These rockets had a 350 millimeter wide warhead that may have held up to 50 or 60 liters of sarin. These rockets could have been launched from the Iranian Falak 2 330 millimeter rocket launching system which is known to be operated by Syrian military forces. So it's an unguided rocket, basically a bottle rocket on a truck. The Syrian government had not violated the 1925 Geneva Protocol in its conduct of this attack, but it, and it was not a signatory to the Chemical Weapons Convention. Nonetheless, it did violate the international norms of those nations who viewed chemical weapons use as a taboo issue in the context of contemporary military conflict. The chemical weapons use represented a threat of lowering the bar barrier to chemical weapons proliferation across the globe to include attacks against US national security interests. As a result, President Obama asked Congress for its approval to use military force as a form of coercion to make Assad stop using those chemical weapons against insurgents and non-combatants. The Defense Department developed plans in coordination with French forces to attack 50 targets in Syria, starting with Navy Arleigh Burke class destroyers firing Tomahawk missiles and followed by airstrikes. This announcement appears to have had the result on Syria to stop its chemical weapons attack, at least for 2013 and the most of 2014. The Russian government then stepped in as to act as an intermediary to suggest that if Syria were to sign on to the Chemical Weapons Convention and dispose of its chemical weapons, then maybe the intervention of US forces could be avoided. The US government and the Russian government had in fact been in talks in 2012 about finding a way to diplomatically push Syria to stop using those chemical weapons, but the Russian government had been unhelpful in supporting any OPCW inspections or efforts to restrain Syrian forces from its actions. But with this threat of action, the Syrian government agreed to dismantle its chemical weapons program and allow the OPCW inspectors who were already in country to visit the site of the attack. Now the OPCW did not attempt to attribute the source of these attacks. That is not their role. They were just there to determine if a chemical attack had occurred, although certainly circumstantial evidence strongly suggested government forces had caused the attacks. Assad protested that the insurgents had caused the chemical attacks and the Russians suggested this was an attempt by the insurgents to provoke an international response. In any case, there was an agreement and a proposed framework by which Syria's weapons would be eliminated and the Syrian government agreed to it. Now the Chemical Weapons Convention has rather generous conditions by which nation states can agree to openly submit details about their declared chemical weapons programs and then take steps to destroy said weapons and facilities over a period of time. For instance, the US government ratified the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1997, which meant that it was obligated to destroy all 31,000 metric tons of chemical agents and associated weapons by 2007. The US government didn't make that deadline and in fact had to ask for an extension three times. However, Syria had a much more strict terms to meet, both because of extenuating circumstances of its active use of said weapons and possibly because it had a very small stockpile. So Syria was not given two years to build a facility to dispose of its chemical agents and 10 years to complete its efforts as Libya was given 
for instance, in 2004, Syria was given a little more than half a year to remove its chemical weapons from very storage sites and to destroy them. This was unrealistic under any but the most idealistic scenarios, but that was the deal. This is what Syria, de Syria declared as its current stockpile. Syria had never perfected the process of making sarin nerve agent to a high standard of quality. As a result, its sarin agent was impure and started breaking down almost immediately, which caused Syrian forces to use a binary process of combining two chemicals, methylphosphonyl difluoride, or DF, and isopropyl alcohol. So that's why you don't see sarin nerve agent listed as a declared chemical agent on this list. Mustard agent, on the other hand, was much easier to develop and more stable over long periods of time. Over half of the declared chemicals were merely industrial chemicals that could be used in other capacities. But for the sake of compliance with the CWC treaty, Syria had to destroy its mustard agent and the Schedule I precursors to the point of not being able to, do, to reverse the process so as to make chemical weapons at a later date. Now, yes, there is always the question of whether Syria held back on some of its chemical weapons or its production facilities, and sure, that could have happened. But that should not take away from the point that this is the way the diplomatic process works, and Syria was living up to its conditions of the agreement at the time. If it was holding back on quantities of chemical weapons or facilities, there is a challenge mechanism within the treaty to address this issue. But no state party of the Chemical Weapons Convention has ever challenged another state on its chemical weapons program. You will also note that chlorine gas is not listed in this declaration. Chlorine as a basic industrial chemical necessary for scores and industrial processes is not on the list of regulated chemicals or precursors. Yes, the deliberate use of improvised chemical bombs that have chlorine gas fills is a violation of treaty, but a nation state does not to have to declare its total holdings of chlorine gas or dispose of them as a party to this treaty. So if one were to use the example of how the United States assisted Libya in destroying its chemical weapons, Libya converted an existing production facility to destroy its 22.5 metric tons of mustard agent and 846 metric tons of precursors. It had made its declaration in 2004, but didn't have an operational plant running until 2010. This was the Rapta Toxic Chemical Destruction Facility paid for by the State Department. The Libyan Civil War had temporarily disrupted operations but the Libya was able to complete destruction on its Schedule I chemicals by February 2014. Syria should have followed this example and built or designed a facility in its country for the purposes of moving chemical, for the purposes of chemical destruction. But it claimed it was unsafe to move everything to one location and then dispose of them during a civil war. Also, they didn't have the money to do this. This led to the discussions on moving the chemical weapons out of Syria immediately, so as to ensure the Syrian military didn't continue to use these weapons. However, there's a legal catch in the Chemical Weapons Treaty that, there is, that a nation state that has built chemical weapons is not allowed to transfer its chemical weapons to another nation. But the UN's uh, OPCW quickly granted a waiver for this one instance. So there were several options available to the US government, none of which were ideal. No one wanted to extend the deadline and risk continued Syrian use of chemical weapons. So the alternative was move the weapons to a nearby nation state and use an existing disposal plant there or build a temporary disposal facility. However, nobody wanted the media scrutiny or the public outcry over having chemical weapons destroyed in their country despite the fact that it was a very safe process and hazardous chemical disposal is routinely done in the quantities of millions of tons each year by any technically advanced nation. The optics were bad and no politician was willing to take on this mission. There were two military option, uh, options advanced, 
if it appeared that insurgents were about to overrun any of the storage facilities or production sites, one could use the army to seize the chemical weapons through an airborne invasion or destroy the facilities through targeted airstrikes. Neither of these options were particularly attractive, but the US military did develop plans for such contingencies. The fact that people were seriously thinking about these options ought to demonstrate the lack of thought given the WMD policy in this contemporary period. Finally, there was the option of creating a mobile disposal platform and putting it on a large ship in the middle of the Mediterranean. This was not without its own controversy, in particular with the public of those nations bordering the Mediterranean who were concerned about accidents or incidents where the chemical agents might be released into the sea, which would impact, of course, both public health and the tourism industry. Lots of people still remember nation states dumping World War I and World War II chemical munitions into the sea at the end of hostilities. But this seems the best of the options given. I wanna give a little bit of back history on the military's WMD elimination mission. During Operation Iraqi Freedom, OSD had to directed the military to, to develop a task force to go into Iraq as combat operations were continuing for the purpose of getting Iraq's chemical weapons and ensuring they were not taken by insurgents. This exercise was not entirely successful in part because it was an ad hoc effort without significant consideration as to what to, was to be done, and in part due to the fact that the US government had wildly exaggerated Iraq's chemical and biological weapons program, and there was nothing there to grab. Regardless, OSD identified the need to have a joint task force for elimination in the 2006 Quadrennial Defense Review to develop a standing capability for future exercises. Long story short, no service to include the Army wanted to resource and house a standing joint task force for this mission. As a result, US STRATCOM authorized a small 60 person headquarters element at DITRA in 2012 to develop plans for future contingencies, an office that was never fully staffed. And if this happened, the army would of course provide the majority of these operating forces for such a future event, even as big army refused to take on an unresourced requirement. So when Syria started its chemical attacks in 2012, OSD asked its acquisition side of the house to start a senior integration group for the purposes of developing technical and operational options to address chemical uh, the Syrian chemical weapons program. This brought in a slew of technical experts, primarily from DITRA and the Army, but also the State Department, UCOM and CENTCOM, of interest, the Standing Joint Task Force Headquarters was not in charge of this effort, but the Joint Program Executive Office for CB Defense created a Joint Program Manager for Elimination to manage the acquisition of a disposal system. There were some historical precedents for this exercise. The Army in particular understood these agents and had decades of experience in disposing of them. So it was more of an exercise of determining the right fit for this particular challenge. In general, the Army knew how to deploy mobile assets to destroy small quantities of chemical weapons and agents, and this was not dissimilar to previous events other than the scale of this operation. A government team that was led by the Edgewood Chemical Biological Center, as it was called then, and including DITRA, the JPM for Elimination, and the Chemical Weapons Agency, designed and procured a transportable field deployable hydrolysis system. This initiative was started in February 2013 and took about 20 weeks until the first unit was delivered. The system was meant to be deployed globally and made operational within 10 days after arrival on site. It is based on neutralization technology and designed for high throughput of five to 25 metric tons per day and was tested to be 99.9% .9 effective. The, high, the reactor tank can hold up to 2,200 gallons. The drawback is that the neutralization process creates five to 14 times the amount of effluent waste in relation to the chemical warfare material being treated. So one of the disadvantages to neutralization, whereas high temperature incineration would not create nearly as much waste. 
It was designed to be operated by 15 people per shift and was intended to be operated along with a personal decon stations, chemical agent filtration systems, an on-site laboratory and power generators. It was a well-developed effort given the short period of time. So let's talk about the ship that it would be on. The US Cape Ray is a ready reserve force vessel under the Military Sealift Command, normally prepared for the mission of moving military equipment and supplies from the United States to overseas combat zones. The ship has more than 175,000 square feet and a vast open spit deck, ideal to hold two of the operational systems in all the chemical agents and associated waste products. The equipment would be installed in December 2013 and the ship departed from Portsmouth, Virginia in late 2014 with a crew of 36 civilian mariners, more than 60 technical experts from Edgewood, a security team and other military members. It arrived at the US Naval Station Rota in Spain two weeks later. It would sit there for months as the Syrians worked with the Russians and OPCW to collect, repackage and move the chemical containers to the part of Latkia. Once the chemical containers arrived at the Syrian port, two container ships, one from Norway and one from Denmark, would take on the containers and under armed escort, move them to Gioia Taro, a port in Italy, to transfer those containers to the Cape Ray. Security conditions prevented the Cape Ray, a US military vessel, from docking at the Syrian port. And even the two ships uh, from Norway and Denmark only docked for hours at a time while the containers were loaded. Other naval ships to include ships from the US, China and Russia provided protection for the Cape May during its operations. Once the neutralization process was complete, the effluent would be transferred to other ships and sent to industrial waste facilities for high temperature incineration. The US government had no trouble finding industries in taking the, on the hazardous waste created by this process. There were 35 interested private companies of which 14 provided bids to handle the final disposition of the chemicals. Much of the disposal will be handled by Echochem in Finland with some work for Viola ES in the UK and United States. Additional support came from the government labs in Germany and the United Kingdom. So this is an illustration of how the two operational systems were laid out to include the chemical agents and effluent waste. I'm not going to walk you through this process. Operations on the ship did not start until July. The Danish ship Ark Futura would move the DF and mustard to the Cape Ray, while the Norwegian Tyco would move category two industrial chemicals to disposal sites in Finland and the United States. The Arc Futura would eventually hold 224 storage tanks filled with DF and 15 storage tanks filled with mustard agent. The Cape Ray's technical team was able to process the nearly 600 metric tons of chemicals in 42 days, completing their disposal operations by August 17th. In the process of neutralizing these chemicals, 6,000 metric tons of waste was created. There were no security incidents throughout the operation and there were no spillage incidents. The Cape Ray returned to Portsmouth and on uh, September 17th and was cleared for unlimited operations in January, 2015. So this illustration re represents the intricate dance that the operation took over, over the year 2014. I'm not going to walk you through this other than to say, it was a very successful operation aided by numerous agencies and coalition partners. The industrial firms that were responsible for destroying the final effluent waste had no problems dealing with the metric tons that were delivered to them. For instance, the Echochem facility in Finland handled 1500 kilotons of industrial waste in 2015. So handling six kilotons of waste generated by this operation was really no challenge. The United Kingdom's Viola facility destroys about 50 kilotons of waste every year. This was not the hard part of the disposal operation. 
The hard part was satisfying the OPCW inspectors that the process was complete. The overall cost of the operation was not clear given the many different sources of funding and where the money went. Ballpark estimate from my county would be about $500 million for this operation. An article in the Nonproliferation Review Journal noted at least six case studies on WMD elimination. These included cases in South Africa, the former Soviet Union, Iraq twice, Libya, and Syria. Three of these were traditional cooperative threat reduction efforts, while the other three were coercive threat reduction efforts. There's an alarming lack of consistency across the interagency as to what we mean by WMD elimination and who is to play the major roles in successfully dismantling a WMD program. However, we can agree that in general, the ad hoc process that resulted in Syria's CW elimination was successful. As a result, the international community is encouraged by the continuation of a strong chemical weapons arms control regime. But we have still not come to grip on how to do WMD illumination for the future. The OSD acquisition group that led this process did so because they had the money and they had the people. The combatant commands and the services were following because they didn't have the money or the expertise to do the planning and the execution. This ought to be a remarkable indictment of the DOD policy process. If WMD is a significant threat, then we ought to have a much more qualified and deeper bench on the operational side, and we don't. Given the interagency component of this exercise, at the least, this should have been a Jiasic and not an ad hoc OSD working group. Big Army still doesn't see this mission as belonging to them, even as the Chemical Corps struggles to develop some degree of interest in the topic. The Chemical Corps, while fine technicians, are not able to work or are unwilling to work the policy side of the House. And despite doctrinal references to the importance of countering WMD, there's no meat here. Finally, we should note the continuing debate as to whether Syria did declare all its chemical weapons capabilities and whether its continued use of improvised chemical weapons requires a deliberate US response. Does this still matter to US national security interests? As I've mentioned, chlorine is not regulated under the CWC, but the offensive use of improvised chlorine bombs is a violation of the treaty. The Syrian military has not stopped using these types of devices, often dropped by helicopters, despite its ratification of the treaty. In 2017, Syria conducted at least three significant chemical weapons attacks, one from a helicopter using a chlorine bomb and two incidents of using a single Su-22 fighter bomber using sarin-filled aerial bombs against the town. The overall casualties were light. In response, the Trump administration directed the U.S. military to launch 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles against the Shayrat Air Base in the Homs area, which was the alleged source of the chemical weapons attacks. Hours after the U.S. missile strikes, Syrian aircraft resumed attacks against insurgent positions. In 2018, Syria returned to the use of chlorine bombs in at least three incidents. In May 2019, the U.S. concluded that Syria had used chlorine against insurgents in Latvia and issued a stern warning to Syria to stop such acts. Syria may be reducing the number and scope of its chemical attacks more because it's winning its civil war against the insurgents rather than because of any external pressure. Also, they could be just thumbing their nose at us. We could do a lot better in this area if we spent the time to think about WMD policy. Currently, we're limited to discussions hosted by technical or acquisition experts who lack the ability to view this issue in the larger context of national security. And the US national security community stopped caring about WMD issues other than arms control at least 10 years ago. During the 1990s, counterproliferation and WMD issues were at the forefront of discussions, and even up to 2008, we had no problem getting WMD issues into national security guidance documents. 
Today, we have very serious people suggesting that emerging infectious diseases are WMD and that we should rechannel chem biodefense funds into countermeasures for natural disease outbreaks. We've lost our ability to build thought leaders in this area. And unless we take steps to reverse this, we're going to continue to lose our ability to address WMD issues in future contingencies. We ought not to have to ad hoc our way through every WMD crisis as has been our past practice. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions.